How do you find a good woman? Well, it starts with being a good man. And today's guest is known as the chick whisperer because he knows what women want. And, you know, honestly, I've been out of the dating game for a long time. My wife and I have been married for 26 years. And I don't know anymore. <laughs> I know what my wife wants. I don't know what other women want. I think I can understand uh, some of what's happening in the world today when it comes to that. But this guest gets it. He's worked really hard to research and understand what women are looking for. And he helps you become the kind of man that is more attractive and that can have exactly what a woman wants. Today's guest is Scott McKay. You're a man. You want to become a better woman. You want to level up. That's nobody's task but your own. This is your starting line. This is your boot camp. It starts now. Welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast with Josh Hatton. Guys, welcome to the Manlyhood Man Cast. I appreciate you for listening, for tuning in, for making manlyhood a, a successful endeavor. You know, we've been doing this for 11 years, and we've had the opportunity to reach almost a million listeners on our, our podcast, which is amazing. Uh, and I'm really grateful that you guys have been a part of this. And guys, we're going to continue to reach people. Season 8 is going to be launching in the fall. And if you've got a brand that you want to get in front of people, if you've got a business that serves men, get in touch with me. Uh, I've got some affordable rates to help you get your product, your brand, your service, your coaching program in front of men. So let me know. Get in touch with me. Manlyhood.com at gmail.com. And let's see if we can help you sponsor Manlyhood to get it in front of the right audience to help you grow. So let me know. Let's make it happen. Maybe you don't want to sponsor Manlyhood, but you want to support Manlyhood. The best way to do that is to help spread the word. So leave, it, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you're listening to podcasts. Share it with a friend. Let's get the word out. A few months ago, guys, I appeared on the Mountaintop Podcast with today's guest, Scott McKay. He's a renowned relationship coach, author, and host of the Mountaintop Podcast. And he's got insights in expertise into how to become the kind of man that can attract the kind of woman that you want. He helps men reclaim their confidence and navigate the dating world and build meaningful connections. He's got a passion for empowering men to embrace their masculinity and find fulfillment in relationships. It shines through in everything he does. He's a good man, and he's got some great insights for you today. Without further ado, Scott McKay. Scott, hey, it's great to have you on the Mainlyhood Mancast. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Good to talk yeah. to you. Yeah, we had a conversation uh, for your podcast recently, so it's awesome to be able to kind of have you on our show here and get to know you a little better. So why don't you uh, tell me about the work that you're doing? I know you've got a, a podcast and you're helping men to with their dating and their relationships. Yeah, man. Well, first of all, Josh, you were a great guest and we had you on the show. I'm not sure whether this show is going to air before ours or vice versa. But definitely the show we've been doing, the Mountaintop Podcast for Men, been a staple in the men's dating advice industry since 2006, man. We've been podcasting since 2006 on dating and relationships. It used to be called the Chick Whisperer, right? But whispering is so, you know, 2001. So we updated the show and a little bit more of a focus on masculinity in general. A lot more guys are coming in who are in relationships with a great woman. And that's what we talk about. All this started for me after a, a really terrible divorce where everybody told me it wasn't my fault and I was the greatest husband ever. And I just didn't like feeling like a victim, Josh. So mm -hmm. I went out to try to understand women, go figure, be as attractive to them as I could be given who I was. And sooner than later, both my friends and, and the women I was dating said, you should write a book on this because you're getting a lot of it right. So that's basically what led to all this. And ultimately I've um, been married to the greatest woman I've ever met for 17 years now. Awesome. So uh, what does she think about you uh, teaching others how to how to handle that? Is she, is she okay with what you're doing? 
Oh, well, I was doing it. Uh, well, actually, I started in December of 2005, and I met her in early February of uh, 2006. So actually, it's going to be 18 years we've known each other just in a few days from when we, hmm. we uh, record this. Uh, she actually goes out in field with me to help guys figure out how to talk to women. I think the differentiator, Josh, is that we don't talk about pickup and getting laid. Um, what I'd show guys how to do is just how to get real with themselves, uh, be the kind of men uh, who exhibit masculinity as women define it. And a lot of macho guys are like, I don't give a rep who, how women define my masculinity. Well, you should because masculinity and femininity, by definition, are the building blocks of sexual attraction. They're what make our sexual nature what it is. And, um, you know, a lot of us like to burp and fart and drink, do wheelies in third gear on our sport bikes and play golf and stuff. The women don't care about that as much. Well, any more than we care about them going shoe shopping and having a spa day and going to the bathroom in groups. It's just kind of something women do. Uh, just like all that stuff's what men do. Uh, women care about a man who can provide and protect and make her feel safe and comfortable. And that gives her femininity a place to come out, not only be playful and fun, go figure in the lives of a man, right? But kind of re re-energize our batteries as warriors and all that. The beauty of it is much logical sense as it makes is uh it, it creates sexual energy and so when guys are put in the just be friend zone usually women aren't feeling that from them it's like well you're just a real nice guy but you're not making me feel anything visceral and sexual so my wife goes around all day not having to do anything she simply is feminine which makes men feel visceral and sexual and the same is the true for us as guys when we know how to portray masculinity in that natural way. It's not like we can dumb ourselves down and stop being that guy. So what I'm hopefully imparting to gentlemen out there everywhere is uh, how to make women want more of you instead of less of you. And obviously my wife's very proud. I don't know if it's obvious when you ask the question, but she's proud to be married to a guy who, uh, who does that for her. And it's, uh, it's a simple fact that even though I may see other women, talk to other women, and may even be charming to other women. I've, I've chosen my wife for many options, and she feels chosen, which all comes back to her feeling safe. So um, she teaches women everywhere how to be more attractive to men. Uh, sometimes the guys want to hear from her, and uh, sometimes both of us get on the phone with women to teach them how to be uh, or show them the way of being a little bit more attractive to men to get what they want out of their relationships. And so, no, there's never really any jealousy or any resentment. We're absolutely on the same page about all of that. That's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, so I think what you're doing is something that's really needed today. I, You know, there's a lot of talk. I mean, when you hear this kind of talk from the media, I generally just kind of say they don't know what they're talking about. But there's a lot yeah. of talk about the incel community. Mm. And, you know, almost they see them as a threat. And in some ways, I mean, some of those guys maybe – actually be a threat because they're often guys who don't know how to use what their masculinity is and then it ends up coming out in toxic or dangerous ways um but i don't think that just because a man is involuntary celibate right like he, he's celibate but doesn't want to be you know he doesn't have any women interested in him more often than not it's just because nobody's really explained it to him and showed him what it means to be a man is that your your take on that well i find it incredibly curious that the quote-unquote incel community tends to be portrayed in the media as perhaps the last bastion of people who are less privileged and getting less out of life than someone else, but they can be freely just excoriated publicly for it. In other words, these are people who aren't getting the privileges other people get, and then they're allowed to be hated on more for that. And I think that this might be an unpopular thought, but I think a lot of it is their own doing because these communities of men who are upset with women for whatever reason, to the point where we're either involuntarily celibate or we've, we're men going our own way or these red-pilled guys, manosphere guys who it's all about rah-rah speeches to men about how you don't need women anyway. It really feels a lot like angry feminism, only the men's version. And because men have been seen as the oppressors and the ones with the privilege for centuries, those kind of guys aren't going to find a whole lot of sympathy. 
if anything, there's kind of a schadenfreude on the part of the rest of the world that we hope those guys will continue to fail because they represent everything we're rallying against anyway. What I've noticed about those guys is they eschew any real cohesive unity as a movement per se, and they don't like to be defined. And anytime you don't define something or you question the definitions of something or even peel that completely away, you're left with a term that has no meaning. When a term can be whatever you want, it is devoid of any meaning at all. And I think that's part of a larger agenda to kind of rid the world from having to deal with it. So you saw that with God, right? If God can be whoever you want him or her to be, then there is no God. Uh, then it came down to, you know, all masculinity is toxic. All you guys sit down, shut up, stop doing what you're doing. But what do we do instead? Well, we're not really given an answer. We're just told everything mascu masculine is toxic, you know, beating people up, murder, guns, weapons, killing, etc. But it's, it's strangely, all the all feminists have co-opted what I would consider to be the more virtuous masculine traits for themselves. Safety, security, provision. I am of the opinion that leadership isn't necessarily masculine, but I think it is definitely a masculine trait to be the head of one's household, right? The provider and protector in the best interest of everybody else in your household. And women are certainly turned on by that. But when we take that away, we're left with nothing. So it's almost like they're following this trend that has caused them to be where they are right now by taking away the definition of who they are and what they're about. So in the case of an incel, you know, all people really have to look at, devoid of a definition, and if anything, this is a little bit of an aside, but I think incels are, if anything, more directly defined as guys who are involuntarily celibate, but... When you see all these guys with such an angry, vengeful attitude, it's leadership. And people are going to respond to them in kind. And that's what's wrong with the incel movement. Anytime men behave like victims, poor me, these, you know, women, expletive deleted, won't give me any sex. So it's their fault. You know, that's just the irony, perhaps, is that's an inherently unattractive way of looking at things. But I have yet to meet incels who are really very interested in looking in the mirror and doing something about it. And see, as soon as I say that, I'm going to get backlash from the guys who characterize themselves like, you know, like you're putting us in a box. That's not all of us. That's not what we really believe. And it just it seems like that's a convenient way to kind of play a Jedi mind trick on anybody who would challenge them. Yeah. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want their minds changed. They just want to be who they are and make someone pay for it. And that's not any way to live as a man. You know, what did Dean Wormer say in, uh, in Animal House? Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. Well, you know, being an angry victim who doesn't want to do anything to be a better man is not a way to go through life, son. That's my Dean Wormer translation. The, what the statistics are telling us about young men mm. not dating, not choosing a spouse, choosing mm -hmm. to, you know, like the st statistically the way that it used to be is obviously lessened. But I know that from my knowledge of a lot of the guys that are out there, whether or not they fall into that box is irrelevant. You've just got guys who don't have a mate and they want that. Some of them are going to be the guys that are playing the victims. Some of them are the guys mm -hmm. that are going to be, I don't need it. And I'm just angry. And some of them are guys. If you that don't are like, need it, stop being angry about it. Right, exactly. And some of them are going to be the guys that we can help, that you can help. Yeah. The yeah. guys are like, okay, I'm ready. How do I become more attractive? So when they come yeah. to you and they ask that question, and they're they, they're like, I, I'm ready to do what it takes because I know that I have something to give a spouse. I know that I want to be able to raise a family. Where mm -hmm. do I start? What do you tell that guy? Well, all right. First of all. I talked about anti-victimhood. You're talking about the statistics. I've noticed that weaponization of statistics is for victims. Like, uh, see, it's not just me. Here, here is in writing. Here's a peer-reviewed study that shows you why I'm right and you're wrong and that I'm a victim. And I've noticed people who go out and succeed don't give a rat's behind about the statistics. Um, I'm not going to get married because 50% of marriages end in divorce. Well, if you go behind the numbers and look at why people get married and under the circumstances of what they're getting married about and what they're getting married for, I'm surprised it's only 50%. If you look at the kind of marriages that stay together, then you can make better choices. Um, any guy who doesn't want to be helped isn't going to get any help. And you and I can't help them. All right. 
anybody who needs a psychiatrist who isn't in our reality with us, anybody who has some therapy they got to go through, isn't in a position to be coached. You know, you've got to fix what's broken before you can um, expect to take the, the fixed whole version of that cloth and weave a beautiful tapestry with it. Um, I know you're asking me all the questions that I have unpopular answers to, and I promise I'm a much more easygoing guy than this to my audience <laughs> and under more and more circumstances, but you ask the questions and I'm answering them. When guys come to me, a lot of times I know they are good, decent men who, let's just spell it out, they're underperforming when it comes to attracting women. If they just believed women would like them, they would do much better. If they had a, a cleaner, pure slate when it comes to go out and seeing how they can attract women from now on compared to maybe what they put up with in the past. Men and women combined, this isn't even gender specific, man. But, you know, a lot of people come to me and go, well, I've had two bad relationships in a row and they ruined me. It's very easy to start feeling that the entire other gender is broken this way, that they're terrible this way. And of course, anybody who's different than us and we start making generalities towards how negative they are, uh, you know, that's how, that's how things like systemic racism start. You know, here's someone I don't know, I, who isn't like me, I don't understand them, therefore I fear them, then I start to really dislike them. And I notice that people will find incidences to support their belief system. Um, and, and that could go good or bad. You know, I mean, people with... People have a terrible attitude towards women, never get a good girlfriend. A guy will go, well, here's a guy with a terrible attitude towards women, and he's got a bunch of women. Well, he's going to be the exception to the rule, not the rule. Right, he's and got something it, else that the women want. <laughs> well, perhaps, okay. But, I mean, you know, it's like one of the things I say is if you really want to get better with women, you're going to have to move out from your mommy's basement and stop playing video games all day. And the guys who don't want to change that will come to me and say, well, I know this guy – who's got a beautiful girlfriend and he lives in his mommy's basement and plays video games all day. Well, his chances would be 99% better at getting a woman if he got a job and started seeing women not as someone who's there to protect and provide for him, but that he has this rite of passage and becomes that guy. So I, I know what a lot of guys are saying. Well, wouldn't that count as a statistic? The difference between weaponizing statistics and dealing in, in probability are two very different things. And it comes from whether you're supporting a pessimistic negative attitude or whether you're looking at the probability of something and, and saying, hey, I can embrace this. I can, I can move forward with this. So consider me taking a study where women say they don't like guys who make under $100,000 a year and I make $96,000 a year. So I'm never going to get a girlfriend. See? Well, I mean, you know, you could say to yourself, well, the probability you know, of me being able to provide a better life for my family someday if I learn more about money and get more competent and get the balls to ask my boss for a raise are probably greater if I embrace the reality of that. I'll give the guys a direct example of how that might work. I'm not a very tall guy. And if you look at the statistics and you look at studies and polls, women will often put at the top of the list that they want a tall guy. Well, not being a tall guy, I don't have that going for me. So instead of saying, well, women are never going to like me, I go, well, why is it exactly that women don't like men who aren't so tall? Is there something maybe about the personality or Napoleon syndrome or, you know, their inability to make a woman feel safe or their resentment that makes it more difficult for those guys rather than just the pragmatic f factor of how many centimeters tall they are, right? So I can look at that and I can work on what I can work on. The next thing you know, I look around and I'm not having any problem getting the kind of women I want. So it must not have been as pure a statistical problem as I thought it was. So then that statistic doesn't mean much to me. But yet I'll have guys who are taller than me. I've got 5'10", write me and say, well, look, women don't like short guys. It says here in this study. So I'm screwed and you're wrong. And then when I tell them I'm that much shorter than they are, they're kind of left holding the bag and don't know what to say. And they call me a liar. They need me not to be correct about this. But that's how I intersect probability with statistics. Statistics are somebody else's numbers, somebody else's experience that tends to get weaponized in defense of my victimhood, right? Whereas if I look at the probability of something and I embrace that probability, then I will use it as a way to become more optimistic, not pessimistic. Like, hey, you, you know... It's right there in black and white. If I'm, if I'm better about this, I'm better about that, then 
women will love me more, I'll have a better career, et cetera, et cetera. A great example is, do I make women feel psychologically uneasy when I'm with them? Do I do psychologically strange things, a little creepy, you know? Um, do I call women names? Am I negative towards them? Do I make them feel stupid by belittling them? Uh, do I fail to respect women? And, you know, those are things I have direct control over my attitude and my behaviors towards. If I change those, voila, I become more attractive to women. And uh, this is something that I've seen happen in my life and with the guys that I work with one-on-one uh, -on -one or even who, who consume some of my books and programs. They put it in action, and it's undeniable, the truth, that when we start representing those things that have a high probability of be making us more attractive to women, it'll work. It's, it's not like going to see the doctor. If I have high blood sugar and I keep drinking a bunch of beer and, and pounding a bunch of carbs, my numbers aren't going to look very good when I go see the doctor. If I go on some keto diet where I have like 25 grams or less of keto all day and my body's eating its own carbohydrates from within, my blood sugar numbers will be lower. I mean, and I'm not a doctor. I, just, I know that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with diabetes per se, but you, you see the trend line on what I'm talking about here and how it plays out logically. So what is it that makes a man more attractive to a woman? Well, remember, if you're going to talk about masculinity and femininity being the building blocks of sexual attraction, the catalysts of sexual attraction, and you look at that as being what matters, it's important to look at the intelligent design behind why there's masculinity and femininity to begin with. We need to procreate and make children. Children need to be raised, not left out in the elements to die of exposure and starvation. So some would argue that there wasn't a family unit in the caveman days, and that's an artificial, relatively modern societal construct. But the idea of a mom and dad raising babies works, okay? And if you want to weaponize some studies, there are some studies out there that can weapon how much you matter as a father. There are very few that would help you weaponize that you don't matter. Although, I mean, people will proof text things all the time. They'll find that exception to figure it out. But never mind that right now. The point is, you know, what is a fatherly role? What is a motherly role? The mother will nurture, feather the nest, as it were, take care of, you know, we can't breastfeed children. Okay, I don't care what the politically correct woke people tell you. Guess what? That's not the design. We are, however, more of a design where we protect and provide an overarching cocoon of support around that nest of our loved ones inside. A man who makes good decisions, a man who can make a woman feel safe in his presence, not necessarily because you're a big gorilla of a thug and can beat everybody up. Thankfully, we live in a society here, at least in the Western world, where you don't have to be that guy. A lot of it is psychological. A lot of it is making a woman feel like... She can relax and not have to worry about providing and protecting all those things that are commonly at the base of a Maslavian hierarchy of needs that I'm sure we all know about, you know. Um, when a man provide and protect, provides and protects those things, uh, women can in turn bring about the beauty in life, the fun, the play, the hospitality, our social lives, um, the beauty, the raw beauty that we as men sometimes forget to stop and enjoy. Now we as men love to do the providing and the protecting and the heavy lifting. And we love to be a hero to women. Um, but when say a single mom has to do that providing and protecting all those things that are at the baseline of human existence in the, in the needs area, there isn't much room left to be feminine anymore. They feel like they've got to basically be the man of the house. So one of the great things you can do on a related note is if you go out on a date with a single mom and you know that she's had to carve out just an impossible two hours in her schedule to be with you, sit her in the car, tell her you're turning your cell phone off and I'm about to take you on a two hour vacation where you don't have to worry about anything because I've got everything handled and you will make her physically horny when you say that. Put it to the test. It sounds so simplistic, but... When we meet women and they have a fun, playful personality and they wear an actual dress and they look like a woman and they act like a woman, they make us hornier. They make us more sexually interested. Um, a lot of guys may look at a woman who, you know, is dressed in sweatpants and no makeup and go, well, I'm still hot for her. Yeah, I mean, you know, her body parts are still very feminine and they make us think about sex. You know, there's the golden ratio and all that. But I, um, I could tell you stories about how 
I've taken guys out, you know, we got, we're not got a beer. And one time in particular, I remember there was a woman who was a bartender who uh, identified as non-binary and uh, was very masculine in appearance. And I finally said to my friend, I said, you know, she's a beautiful girl. She's gorgeous. And he looked at me and goes, her? And I said, no, look at her facial features and just look at how she's put together. And it's, it's the masculine nature of her presence and how she acts and what she seems like she's all about which is making you ignore any sexual attractiveness there. So I think even for us as men, there's a lot more to this than, than we give credit for. Whereas women, if you're neuter and you don't, she feels like she has to be your mommy or she has to protect you. Your feelings are getting hurt too easily, or you don't have a plan and she has to rescue you from everything. She will flat out straight up, not be sexually attracted to you. So I think that's how this all plays together. Yeah. I think it's important to especially in that when you go to that next level of okay i'm trying to find one right and then you get one and then your relationship deepens and then you need that emotional intimacy right Mm -hmm. like you know my wife's always wanting to know what's going on inside my heart and how i feel i try to find that balance of letting her know those things so that she feels that we're connected but also Mm -hmm. reminding her like if you really had any idea what's going on inside of my mind you would run away (laughs) Well, I guess that all depends on what's going on inside your mind. Um, (laughs) But yeah, we always want to make sure that the top line task here is to make a woman feel safe and protected. And if you're a guy who rebels against that and let her get her own job and, and, you know, come approach me at a bar, I think you're missing out on some of the great joys of being a man. This isn't something we should see as something we we have to do, but something we get to do, you know. Uh, We don't have to have a period and be pregnant and, you know, go through childbirth and things like that. I mean, it, it's good to be a man, you know, and, and we should embrace that. Yeah. Most women feel like it's good to be a woman. So, you know, that's and while they're, part of like, what I call God's dirty little trick, right? Right. Like you said, too, there, there's obviously exceptions to every rule. But I do think that, that it's safe to say across the board that these things are generally true. You know, you might have somebody who, like you said, maybe identifies one way or another or prefers something different. Mm -hmm. Whatever. That's fine. I think that those things, again, statistically, are not as common as boy meets girl, right? Well, plus they're not here. They're not listening to what we have to say. We're not the people they're going to want to get information from, which is fine also. Right. Because if you're wanting to learn how to do those things, there are other podcasts for that. Well, I mean, for example, I'm sure there's a ton of men out there who would love to know how to stay in their mommy's basement, eat Cheetos all day long, and play video games and still get hot women knocking on their door. (laughs) And if I were to start a business where I purported to be able to teach guys that, I'm sure I would have a million followers by tomorrow morning. But I would also be very disingenuous compared to what I believe and what I think my purpose is. Indeed, disingenuous to lead guys down that primrose path. But I've seen a lot of the pickup artist stuff try to do the same thing. Here, here's three simple phrases you whisper in a woman's ear and she spreads her legs. You know, here's a, a magnet. You point it at your brother's wife at the Thanksgiving table. And next thing you know, she's on top of you in bed. I, I just don't think those are honest. You know what? We're moving away from that. When we record this, we're in February of... 2024. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm trying to pour my thoughts before I even finish the sentence. You get a lot of airplay with uh, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey and their charmed life. And Barbie was the number one movie over the years. You know who's selling a whole lot of, of, of music nowadays is that Jelly Roll guy. You ever see him? I love that dude. You know, that guy has been ridden hard and put away wet. He's almost 40 years old. Spent almost his entire youth in juvie. He's got face tattoos. He's not in good shape. He needs some dental work. He's been kicked around the block. He tried to be a rapper. Okay, I guess that worked. But then you know what he started singing about? He said, I I really wish I could be a better Christian. I wish I could believe in God more. But damn it, I keep drinking and getting drunk and doing stupid things. And I forget to pray until I need a miracle. And, you know, that makes me a hypocrite. And, you know, I don't even know why God should listen to me. And the guy's selling a million records because he's honest and he's real. And it's like, I can relate to that. I love that dude. And I think you're going to see this sea change. Yeah, you know, we're always going to like to see the Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift relationship. I think that's kind of like how we see the royal family, you know, in England. But we don't, 
that's a fantasy thing. That's not what we think is a real life. That's not something we relate to. It's something we fantasize about. And I think people want to get off of social media. They're sick of the politics. None of us want to vote for any of these turkeys they're putting in you know, putting up for office. We wish we had better options. And when we get back out in the real world, we're, we're, we're realizing gay, straight, black, white, short, tall, Jewish, Palestinian. We really just want to be human and get along. And that's hard to do when we're all wrapped up inside our head thinking we're the victim. And it's hard to do when we keep outsourcing our critical thinking ability to the cloud and accepting a hive mind mentality that whatever social media told us was the right way to think, well, I guess I'll just plug into it like a dumb terminal. I guess I'm on a soapbox now, but those of us as men who live up to our masculinity, lead, go out and actually talk to people, and instead of trying to find some cute pickup line for some woman we think is out of our league, just walk up and say, hey, you know, here's my name, what's yours, and have the woman be caught so off guard that guess what? You connect and get along. I think it would be very refreshing for a lot of people. Very refreshing. And by the way, on a related note, that Jelly Roll guy, go Google his wife. Yeah, I've seen it. I, uh, mm-hmm. So Jelly Roll and Oliver Anthony are two examples of something in this past year that I think really speak to what we're about to see. Day you agree job, I'm a marketer, right? And yeah. I do a lot of content creation and I will occasionally use AI because it's helpful. But I think that culturally, we're about to pull away. I think we're already starting to crave the real, the authentic, yes. and we're able to yes. spot a phony a mile away, you know? And I think that's what's happening is that's why you're seeing Jelly Roll at the top of the charts because he's real, you know? That's and you're going to see it from unexpected places. I'm in San Antonio, and we got the first draft pick, Victor Wembenyama, who's a seven foot five, 20 year old kid, just had a birthday. And um, he has all the hype in the world like LeBron James. And you know what? I've noticed the people who didn't draft him from the other team, they're they're just pulling vitriol on this kid because he doesn't feed their disease. He's not an arrogant jerk. He's incredibly difficult not to like. I have a picture on my Twitter of a seven foot five Victor sitting what looks to be a preschool. The kids don't even look like they're in kindergarten. And there's this little boy hugging around his knee, just looking up at him like he loves. And Victor's reading a school book. Everybody in San Antonio says that Victor goes out of his way to be gentle and kind. Because he knows he would scare small children by default. He has that presence about him. He, He has the ability to understand that he needs to work a little harder not to be scary. And it works incredibly well. And they say he, he's not a prima donna. He's all about the team. And there's people who don't know what to do with that except overreact. But, you know, again, it's this, it's this return to just, my goodness, can we just stop this and be real? Well, I think we're actually, if we continue down that path of not being real, I think we're going to start to see society break down even more. You know, I, I noticed the other day there's another wave of the A generated profile pictures on social media it can't last it's unsustainable it's always women you know and i'm like imagine being so embarrassed by your own reflection that you've got to use a computer to make yourself look nice you know i'm not saying i I mean i get it like you you don't want to look like a slob right and you're a little embarrassed i understand that a little bit but imagine imagine getting to the place where you won't even allow a a picture of yourself without a filter or an ai interpretation of yourself and i think well i mean that's a concession to living in a cloud world instead of having your local hard drive intact i mean (laughs) I realize that may be a stretch to the analogy, but you, if you're going to have chat GPT write your online profile and you're going to have AI completely filter your face into oblivion, you don't have an opportunity anymore to meet someone in the real world and expect it to go well. You have forfeited that for some vicarious life where everything is digital. I mean, I guess you and someone who's equally digital can sit around and have digital fun time together. But there's never going to be anything out there that's real. And, um, you know, I think the the movie WALL-E from, Pits, from, from Pixar came out about, what, 2008, 2009? That movie didn't realize how prescient it was. We were already there, you know? People just don't want to even have any... I mean, you know, people don't want anything to do with each other, but they starting to realize we actually do. It is actually really kind of nice. And um, 
I think it's because you don't get any real feeling of being alive. You don't get any visceral feeling of being alive apart from a real world adventure. And you don't get any real satisfaction from your relationships by way of a robot who was forced to say, I love you. You know, I mean, the very God who created us miraculously cares about our agency to have free will to love what created us back, which is weird after all. Why, why would the creator need that from us? But whether you're an atheist, even, you have to understand that's there. You know, we do live in a world where we have a choice to believe even at the baseline level in, in whatever created us or have the freedom not to. And that's just nuts. So how do we think we're going to be at all gratified by an AI girlfriend who will bark like a dog because we asked her to? And how does that make us a better human? It doesn't. I would go so far as to argue that even having Siri has made us angrier and meaner because we can treat Siri any way we want to. And I think it's become a habit for a lot of people. Whenever I use AI to do stuff, I'm always asking it, please, and saying thank you. It doesn't know what to do with it. (laughs) Uh, Real quick, I wanted to ask you this question, too, because I get this question a lot, and I see this argument a lot. Um, Guys are like, well, I I mean, I can't find any good women. They're all OnlyFans models, or they're all, you know, nasty, or they're all, you know, and and they're, they're, they're looking out on the landscape, the dating landscape, and all they're seeing is what they don't want. And Mm -hmm. so they're saying they're not out there. What do you say to that guy? Well, I do have a my first part of that answer is harsh. Okay. I understand there are places where that's pretty true. I mean, you know, I do a lot of traveling. There are metropolitan areas in this country where you're going to go a long time before you see an attractive female human being who's available. And then there are others where they're everywhere. Okay. And, and you wouldn't believe how many of them are single. So, I mean, I understand the struggle can be real, but, and you know what happens when you say, but, I also hear a lot of guys who just come to me, slap their hands on the table, go, I can't get any women to go out with me. And you know, my next question to them is, how many have you attempted to try to make plans with? None. Well, you know, if that is where you're coming from, then I think the answer is self-evident. And a lot of guys have to understand what's scarier, talking to a woman and have it maybe not go as well as you want it to, or dying alone and never having children and never getting married and being lonely and, you know, your whole life. What's scarier? What, what, what is it we should genuinely be wary of, right? Most guys, you, me, most men fit into a window where about 90 plus percent of us fit. We've neither been blessed with unbelievable, you know, genetics of some Hollywood pretty boy, nor have we been hit with an ugly stick. Now, we talked about Jelly Roll. I personally know ugly stick dudes who have amazing girlfriends. I don't even know a whole lot of guys who fit that that pretty boy category. But it's amazing. Of the ones who come to the top of my head, I mean, I'm not attracted to any of their wives personally. I don't think they would be, you know, Hollywood starlet material. So even those guys who are genetically gifted in the looks department, what I know about women is they don't like guys who are prettier than they are. Women want to be the pretty ones. Women are all about the beauty, right? For most of us who are normal guys... I think the the best things we can do, and you and I, I think both do it. I mean, you look like you got a haircut and take care of your beard and everything. Doing the best with what you've got, you know, not no dirt under your fingernails, have a neat beard, I'm just shaving, checking. taking a shower. There might be a little dirt under there today. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if you work a day, it's kind of hot, you know. But, I mean, a guy who does the best with what he has demonstrates to a woman that he can make decisions, has some wisdom, and and, and does the right thing. You know, you're not feckless. You're not hopeless. When guys have no social skill and and make women feel stupid, that says to a woman, you can't provide and protect. Therefore, I'm not horny. And again, the guys are like, well, let her make her own money and buy a gun and protect herself. You're missing the point. It's all about what creates attraction. So I think for most of us, a lot of us think women process attraction the way men do. I'm not pretty enough. Uh, You know, my pectorals aren't huge enough. (laughs) You know, whatever it is. Um... Meanwhile, it's all subjective. I, I mean, most of us as guys are pre-rejecting ourselves vis-a-vis talking to women when we just have no idea what she would have thought. My wife, for some crazy reason, she's adorable. You can look her up online. She thinks I'm the greatest, most handsome dude who's ever lived. I, I don't know where she gets that, but I'm sure glad she did. 
I think it's really because she's my favorite woman all time and she really feels safe in having been chosen, if you'll pardon the passive voice, because I think it makes it, it emphasizes the reality there. I, I, I wanted her. Every other woman I didn't have a need for anymore, and that made her feel especially safe. Therefore, she feels extra horny, I guess. It, it all, it all, the story holds together. It's not a leaky bucket. So for of, those of us as guys, we need to start just talking to women and giving ourselves a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. I mean, do the best with what you got, but the number one differentiator between men who get women and men who don't, Josh, is they believe women should like them. It's that confident reality. And women will often just go, okay, you seem like a guy who should have a girlfriend. And it, because women are different. And I mean, that, to me, that puts us in a favorable position. A lot of these guys are like, women have all the power. They snap their fingers and guys come running. Yeah, tell that to the women who aren't so physically attractive. You're only noticing the women with options. The men with options aren't complaining thus. Men with options are like, oh, I, I get a bunch of women. I just have to find one. I have, my picker's broken. You know, women come to us, they're beautiful, and they go, I keep... Same bad relationship, different guy. Well, I mean, you know, you have to start believing there are people out there who are of good character, who are virtuous. And, and Josh, we, we always see the red flags. We just ignore them because she has a nice ass and we've been going through a dry spell. So yeah, I think that comment brings this whole first thing full circle, don't you? Yeah, for sure. Well, hey, yeah. man, I know you've got to go, but I've got a couple real quick questions I'm going to ask you fast, rapid fire. Make it happen, Captain. What I'm does it excited. take to be a man? Uh, it takes masculinity, the way women define it. I don't think men are victims. I think men take responsibility. Men understand uh, it's good to be a man, and they act like it. And by the way, I don't think you have to be macho to be a man. Some of, some of the most masculine guys who women just find amazing, who have that presence and have that ability to make people feel safe and comfortable, have a plan and make good decisions, didn't come off as macho. By every account, Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood fame was that man. That was the name that I was going to throw out there. <laughs> and he's not macho. Yeah. Um, and by the way, you can be playful and fun and really bring out a woman's feminine nature without being feminine. And the guy that comes to mind is one of the guys I love, and God bless him, rest his soul, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Dude, he was like a little kid with how stoked he was or everything. Everything was exciting and cool. And his wife, Terry, to this day, I think worships him. Okay? His kids do. His wife was kind of sullen. She needed to be brought out of her shell a little bit. You know? She had a little more stoic of a personality for a female human being. And, and she just thrived off his energy and his enthusiasm. But, you know, other than pulling the spike out of his heart when he got jabbed by a stingray, he made pretty good decisions. And he was confident, and he knew how to protect his family. You, know, you could argue, well, how well are you protecting your family when you have alligators and crocodiles around all the time? And he never ate his but, family. You know, he had that aura. He had that ability to make you think he had everything under control. Yeah. And that was very, very masculine. All right. You get your hands on a flux capacitor, and you can go back in time to visit 10-year-old Scott. What do you want to tell him? I want to tell him, relax and have fun. The girls love you. And stop being so hard on yourself and being a perfectionist. My seventh grade teacher was an all-American lacrosse player. And he came to teach at my school. And the girls just worshipped him because he was a good-looking dude. He wrote in my seventh grade yearbook exactly what I just said. Because <laughs> he looked around me being horrified of all the little girls who were trying to talk to me. And, and just being my own worst enemy. And the crazy thing was, even though he wrote that in my yearbook, I didn't pay attention to it or even know what it meant probably for another 15 years. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. All right. What is your best advice for the men that are listening today? Best advice is to stop being your own worst enemy, stop being a victim, and give agency and confidence a try. Just give it a blessed chance and see if it can work for you. And I know that's a tall ask. And it may involve you jumping out of the airplane, wondering if the ripcord is going to actually function as advertised. But until you jump out of that plane, you're going to keep always getting what you always got. And you can take it from a guy who's lived that life. And I'm here raising my hand saying, you know, it's worth giving a try. Awesome. All right. If the guys want to get in touch with you, man, what's the best way for that to happen? Hey, you guys are already podcast listeners. Uh, best place to start is the Mountaintop Podcast. Get it wherever you get uh, podcasts from. 
Um, because of what we talk about, I got to tell you guys, I need you, man. I want you. I, I, I value your listenership because the shadow ban me for being a little conservative just because I talk about what I talk about. So every listener matters, and, and I value each and every one of you. And you guys can write me. I tell you on my show, you can get on my calendar and talk to me. I, I value talking to you guys because it, it keeps me in front of what matters to you guys. So the Mountaintop Podcast is the way to go. If you go to scottmckay.net, you can also download my book, Deserve What You Want. It's usually $37 every day. I'll give you a copy of it. My name is 1T, as you can see here in the lower window. Just write that out, scnatsnot.com, and uh, it'll take you right to the right page. Listen, read, whatever floats your boat, I'm there for you. And um, pretty much what you see is what you get. I'm the exact guy you think I am. So let's do this thing. Awesome. We'll include your links there in the show notes as well so you guys can mm-hmm. click through and connect with Scott. So, hey, man, I really appreciate you taking the time with us today on the Manlyhood Mancast. Hey, man, I appreciate you being on my show. It was a great show. Hope the guys will listen in. And, uh, man, great questions today, fantastic conversation, and it focused on exactly what I'm so passionate about. So thanks, man. I appreciate you. Awesome. I appreciate you too. Thanks, man. Scott, thank you so much for being on the Mancast today. Guys, if you are listening and you're appreciating what he's doing or if you need some of the help that he has to offer, reach out to him. Tune into his podcast. I'm sure that what he's got is exactly what you need. I appreciate you guys tuning in today. Uh, Again, remember, Season 8 is going to be launching here in the fall, and I want to get your brand, your message, in front of my listeners. So if you're listening and you're saying, hey, look, I know that we can really benefit uh, by a partnership, I can get you some affordable rates, so let me know. Anyway, guys, I just want to let you guys know that I really do appreciate you being a part of this movement of men working to become even better men. As always, I love you. I'm proud of you, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Manlyhood Mancast. If you want to be a better husband, father, leader, a better man, you need to join our private Facebook group, the Manlyhood Mancast. Join today. Please help us out with a like, comment, share, and subscribe, and check us out at manlyhood.com.